اللهم تسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اجمعين ان شاء الله today we're going to be uh, speaking about uh, Ramadan uh, it's quite amazing that we only have uh, about a month left before um, ان شاء الله we are hoping and expecting um, for ان شاء الله another blessed opportunity to uh, enjoy and experience the month of Ramadan um, as the sister recited uh, the verses uh, from surah al-baqarah jazakallah khair um, the reason, there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislates uh, any ibadah. When he legislates something, it's for a reason. There's a purpose. Uh, there's a maqsad. In fact, the sharia has uh, its maqasid, which are well known to uh, the students of sharia and, and uh, usul al fiqh. And sometimes we are told what the uh, maqsad or the purpose behind an ibadah is. And other times we may not understand or we may not be explicitly told. Um, a psalm or siyam, uh, fasting in the month of Ramadan has been linked to a clear purpose. Uh, it has not been kept hidden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامَ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O oh, you who believe fasting has been prescribed for you. Yani prescataba means uh, written, literally, means made obligatory, made fold, made wajib. Uh, just as it was made fard upon those that were before you so that you may attain taqwa. So this is the purpose, right? And uh, it's not just taqwa for the month itself. It's a uh, taqwa that is supposed to become second nature. It's a taqwa that's supposed to, uh, you know, out uh, outlast the month itself. Uh, so it's like it's preparation for something, uh, you know, far greater than, um, you know, far longer than just those uh, 30 days. Now, um, another point that we want to make, uh, which is mentioned in the tafsir of this ayah, is that there are certain uh, sins, uh, certain dhunub uh, that make uh, a human being liable for punishment. If they don't repent from uh, a particular sin or certain sins, a person becomes liable uh, for punishment uh, in the fire of hell. We seek Allah's refuge um, from that. Um, but al psalm it's called in a hadith, it's called Jannah, al psalm Jannah. Which means that the psalm, the uh, fasting, is a shield. Yani, it's something that protects you, shields you from the fire of hell uh, that you were liable to fall in because of the certain sins that you had committed. Uh, so, a psalm or fasting offers, you know, uh, a, a great deal of a protection uh, against the uh, fire of Jahannam itself. Um, it was once said to uh, an old man who was much given to fasting. He would fast quite uh, frequently. And it was said to him, you know, you're an old man, fasting weakens you, so you know, why is it that you fast so much? And he said uh, the very eloquent words, he said, Inni u'adduhu li safrin taween, wa sabru ala ta'ati Allah ahwanu min as-sabr ala adhabi. Which means that I am preparing for a long journey. And you know, when we go away on uh, trips, uh, you know, the summer is coming up, uh, we may be planning different things. We prepare according to the length of the journey, right? So this person is looking at the length of his journey from the moment of his death to the moment he is resurrected and he has to go through the hasab until uh, finally it is, uh, his fate is revealed to him, whether it's towards the Jannah or Jahannam. So he's looking at this suffer, he's looking at this journey that he still has to go through. He's at the end of his life, but the journey has yet to begin. So he, he, so he responds by saying, I'm preparing for a long journey. And sabr, patience on the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much easier than patience against his punishment, against his adab. That is much more difficult to bear. So what, was it, what he's doing is he's using the psalm, he's using the fasting as something that's going to actually protect him from the adab or the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, um, how then does fasting, uh, how is it supposed to inculcate or develop taqwa? Uh, uh, how is it that... Um, Psalm is supposed to have this desired effect. Number one, we mentioned that it has been prescribed for not just us, but for all uh, nations. So there is a spiritual rejuvenation connected with uh, the fast itself that is supposed to uh, benefit the whole spectrum uh, of uh, humanity. All of those people that it was prescribed for, everyone is um, in a position to benefit from it because of the effect that it has and spiritually uh, really nurturing the soul. You know, our bodies we find are nurtured uh, physically through food. This is the food literally for the ruh. The ruh also requires a, uh, a nourishment, right? So this um, abstinence from food and drink is really through psalm, not just you know taking that away, but taking it away with the understanding 
that this is supposed to bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the whole concept of siyam, someone who really understands it, can then use that uh, apparent hunger and thirst to really uh, form a source of nourishment for uh, the ruh. And this is what the Prophet used to uh, experience. You know, he uh, used to do som al wisal, which is haram for us, by the way. Uh, so, al wisal is where the Prophet would, uh, you know, how we are required to break our fast at uh, Maghrib? We have to break our fast, right? It's fard. Just like it's fard to abstain, at Maghrib it becomes fard to break your fast, and you must do so. Uh, the Prophet, however, uh, in al you don't break your fast at Maghrib. What you do is you continue fasting to the next day. And he would do this uh, continuously at times. And some of the Sahaba, when they saw this, and of course they uh, found themselves less in deeds than him, less in rank and station than him, uh, they said, we want to also do this. And he said, no, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is feeding me and he has given me to drink. So there is something else going on with the, when one, one is in a state of fasting, there is another type of nourishment uh, that is taking place. Um, and this is really the uh, nourishment of the soul. Now what is taqwa? Right, we're talking about how we're supposed to inshallah become more muttaqi, right? Taqwa is really any type of obedience uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any type of goodness that we are able to develop and keep. You know, this is really um, what taqwa manifests uh, itself as uh, when it becomes second nature. Anyone can be good for a day, right? Anyone can be good for even a week, right? But for it to really become a part of your uh, your habits, part of your uh, akhlaq, part of your character, part of who you are, that's really, you know, a much more, it requires a lot more work, a lot more uh, development, a lot more um, uh, control of the nafs itself, which is very difficult to do. At the same time, in the verses that the sister recited, uh, the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word ayyama ma'adudat, right? That this fasting has been prescribed for you and the purpose is to inculcate taqwa. But at the same time, remember, it's only for a short period of time. Ayyama ma'adudat. Yani it's only 30, about 29 or 30 days. Why is this uh, being mentioned in the verses that are obligating the fast? Just to make it, uh, put it in perspective for us that it's not that long of a time period. Because some may become overwhelmed by you know, having to fast and not eating or drinking anything at all. And if we look at the, um, the types of fasting in other uh, religions today, they have some remnants of them really in front of the Muslim fast. They, you, know, you can't even take them seriously. Um, like for example, um, uh, in, in uh, certain traditions, all you have to do is give up a certain food for like 40 days. So like some people, they give up chocolate, some people they give up meat and that's like their you know their fast. Other uh, cultures like the Hindu culture they will fast for their husband, right? And uh, this fast is you know they won't break it until he brings uh, her the food and she has to look at him and then eat the food. These types of things. So it, there's no really other serious you know hardcore fast other than the one we have, right? Like no eating, drinking, no sexual injury, nothing. Um, you know, from sunrise to sunset, no matter how short the day is, as we had, we were blessed with like eight, nine years ago in November, December. And now, subhanAllah, this for us, because of the age we are in, this is going to be the uh, longest fast that we have yet seen, right? Most of us are in our 30s, right? Early 30s, in our 30s. Um, so when we were little, before Yani, we were obligated to fast was the last time that these uh, types of fasts, the length of this uh, this fast came around. So subhanAllah, it's really um, critical that we remind ourselves ayyama ma'adudat. It's only a limited, uh, you know, or a limited time period, even though it's going to be from like six, a 16 hour fast, I believe, right? It's about uh, four, uh, 5 a.m., 5.30. Well, you have to uh, stop eating at the time Fajr comes in, so that's four. And then we'll be opening it about eight, right? So that's a 16 and a half hour fast. So this is incredible. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy uh, for all of us. Now the unique thing about uh, fasting is that, you know, it's, it's, very, it's different from all the ibadat. Why and how? Because normally what's uh, halal becomes haram, right? Water becomes haram, right? Normally a banana is halal, it becomes haram. Normally, you know, going to your spouse is halal, it becomes haram in the daytime. Uh, of Ramadan. So all of these um, things that are normally uh, permissible, uh, that uh, they're uh, uh, halal, uh, the, the fact that they're permissible is disabled. So um, this is supposed to, uh, this is obviously the way that Allah is training us to develop that taqwa, that if you cannot even approach 
the uh, halal, if you can even give up the halal for him, then how is it that after this month is gone that you will then approach or go towards the haram? Um, so this uh, whole month is about the muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why if someone comes to muraqaba is the watchfulness, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching. One of the names of Allah is ar raqib right? So this is um, one of the qualities or the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become most aware of. Right? He is always ar raqib right? But we have this a heightened sense of this sifa, of this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, um, in this month. Um, now, another uh, great benefit of fasting and the way that fasting uh, produces taqwa, this is for those who are take notes, we're talking about how fasting uh, how Siyam inculcates taqwa, how it produces taqwa. Another way is the way it affects shaitan. Not only does the fast have an effect on us, which is the desired effect of producing taqwa, it also has an effect on shaitan. There's a direct effect on the shayateen and the jinn with the coming of the very month of Ramadan. They're physically chained and tied up. So what does this do? How does this affect the shaitan? It weakens him altogether. It weakens his grip on us. His potential grip on us is weakened. And we all can see the people who normally, uh, you know, all of us that normally commit sins and, you know, others around us, um, there's a de decrease in the number uh, uh, of sins. And this is, subhanAllah, uh, something that we learn from the Messenger وسلم, about the shaitan and his normal um, uh, influ potential influence on us because he doesn't have influence on the mukhlisin, right? This we know from the Quran, that he has no uh, effect or uh, grip or hold on the people that, are, uh, that have the quality of ikhlas, right? This is the exception to the rule. So, and, and in Surah Ibrahim, you have the speech that the shaitan will give on the day of judgment, right? To the to the fellow inmates of hell, those people are going to live. All of us have read this, right? In Surah Ibrahim, Sultan, right? That I didn't have any uh, Sultan, any authority over you, right? All I did is I called you and you uh, responded. You were the one. So, so فَلَا تَلُومُونِ وَلُومُ أَنفُسَكُمْ He will say this. So don't blame me, but blame only yourselves. So we already know what he does and we already know what he's going to say. Yet we still uh, out of our negligence, um, follow him. So the Prophet ﷺ told us, "Inna shaytan yajri min ibn Adam majri adam." This is recorded in the Sunan of Ibn Majah, and it means that indeed the shaytan runs through uh, the son or the daughter of Adam like the, the way that blood flows through your veins. So he has, uh, you know, this incredible potential uh, access. Uh, to us, that we, um, alhamdulillah, through fasting, through suyam, uh, it's weakened. This hold that he may have on those that follow him is weakened uh, in this month. And another benefit of uh, fasting, that uh, another rather way it produces uh, taqwa is by feeling that hunger and thirst. That the, uh, you know, the more, uh, the, 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 the poor go through as a living uh, reality all the time. You know, for most of us that are blessed in this part of the world, we don't uh, go through, we don't feel hunger most of the time. Yani, as soon as we feel, start to feel hunger or thirst, we uh, can immediately uh, uh, satisfy that urge. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when we think of uh, something at night before going to sleep, you know, I feel like eating this. Next morning, the first thing we can do is go to the grocery store and get that, and you know, and cook it within, uh, you know, uh, within minutes or, or less, or an hour or so. So subhanAllah, it's, it's almost like Jannah, right? You think of something and you um, you can get it. Not, not quite, because we still have to do effort. Jannah, there's no effort. So um, most of us in this part of the world kind of forget what it feels like to be hungry and not be able to eat, even after you're feeling hungry for a long time. Most of us have forgotten what it feels like to be thirsty and not be able to drink. You know, we, we lose that entire sense. And this is what this was said to Yusuf alayhi salam, who was also much given uh, to fasting. Uh, you know, he, he was asked, you know, why do you starve yourself when you have the khaza, the, you know, the treasures of the world, uh, you know, uh, the land are at your disposal. Why do you starve yourself? Why do you fast so much? And he said, an fa'ansa al Which means that I fear that I would fill myself, yani fill my stomach, and then I, that would cause me, that feeling would cause me to forget the hungry. To forget the one that is hungry. Because really, you can't relate to someone in that state when, um, you know, when you yourself you're, you're you're full. 
So this is um, a reality for many of our brothers and sisters you know, across the world, uh, it, even today. I remember reading a uh, story a couple of years ago about a, a mother in, um, in Palestine, I believe it was in Gaza, which is the most heavily afflicted re uh, area, uh, probably in the Muslim world today, because of the blockade that's in, been in place since 2006. And um, she was trying to prepare a meal uh, at iftar time, it was the month of Ramadan, and she was trying to prepare iftar for her children, and they were all fasting. She was fasting, her children were fasting. And subhanAllah, she couldn't find anything uh, you know, to uh, make a meal with. All she had was like some water and wood, and you know, she was just scrambling to find anything, to find something, subhanAllah. So her, her fast was going to continue. And, and that of her children. So you know, it's 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 easier to donate and be generous in the month of Ramadan when you can feel that hunger and thirst, experience it for a prolonged period of time, and you can't eat and you can't drink because not because we don't have what we need. Um, we are sure of that at Maghrib. Others are not so sure. I remember a call of uh, Imam Ali, radiallahu anh, He said that um, the one who is sure of water will not feel thirst. If you know you're going to get it, you know, it's, it's there, it's in your position, it's just a matter of time, you know, I have it. Now that thirst is not that, uh, you know, unbearable. But for one who, who doesn't have access to drinking, potable drinking water, which is the reality for 70% of the world's population, then the way that they experience their thirst is an altogether different horror that we can't even, uh, you know, begin to grasp. So that indeed is one way that our hearts are softened towards um, the poor. And the last thing is, of course, this, this can, you can never call it the last thing, because it's like the main thing, um, which is sabr, right? Um, the sabr is the whole month of Ramadan is sabr, and one's entire life is sabr. And as soon as you begin to let go of sabr, you begin to lose some of your dignity with it. You begin to lose your, some of your closeness to Allah with it. You begin, begin to lose some of the tazkiyah that you have achieved with it. So sabr is really, uh, you know, the crux, uh, the crux of, of the matter of all the ibadat. It is a requirement of all the ibadat. None of the ibadat can be done without it. If you look at the uh, example of the uh, salah, the salawat, we just had a lecture on sabr the last month. That was the uh, topic for our Tazkiya series. And subhanAllah, we were contemplating how is it possible to pray every day, five times a day, with the uh, required arkan, with the prerequisite uh, of uh, the shurut, um, you know, after having made wudu and, and fulfilling all the conditions of uh, qibla and, you know, uh, hijab and everything, uh, and the right times for the rest of your life, pretty much in sickness and in health, whether you're sitting or standing, whether you're traveling or uh, in your home, uh, for the entire, for your entire life without patience. It's not possible to do that. And if you look at any ibadah, if you look at the ibadah of uh, the hajj, is it possible without patience? You know? Just think of the lines of hajj, and it is enough to, uh, you know, it requires the utmost sabr. And uh, zakah is, you know, controlling your nafs, uh, having sabr against the desire of the nafs uh, to hold on to that man. And look at the uh, uh, psalm itself. So none of the ibadah, uh, sabr is one of those ibadah, it's an ibadah of the heart manifested in the limbs, without which none of the ibadah can be completed. And you will note that once we begin to lose sabr, whether it is with ourselves, whether it is with our children, or with our spouse, we begin to lose some of our dignity. Okay, let's talk a little bit about attentions. We talked about how uh, siyam inculcates taqwa, right? How does uh inculcate taqwa? Now, what is our intention this Ramadan? You know, it shouldn't just be that we're going to fast because it's fold and I'm Muslim and it's Ramadan, so I have to. You know, that's a given, but that is not very exciting. You know, it's not going to have the greatest results in terms of your spiritual growth, right? Um, it's not going to, you know, give you uh, the most spectacular results. To do that, we need to tap into this amazing thing called intention, niya. You know, why am I going to happily uh, do this? You know, sometimes when I tell my, uh, you know, son to do something, you know, he, most of the time, alhamdulillah, he does it. Um, but uh, sometimes he does it with a grudge, and other times he does it, you know, uh, in a better mood. And I tell him, you know, there's no point in doing it if you're going to do it grudgingly. You know, if you're doing it because of authority and not out of, you know, willful uh, obedience or happiness, then it really takes away uh, the merit of the deed. And this is how 
one person's fast is rewarded differently from another person's fast. They're both doing the same thing for 16 and a half hours, but one is going to walk off with a whole lot reward than the other. So what we want to do is maximize our reward because you're doing it anyway, and you're doing, uh, we're going, going to be doing an intense form of the soul because of the length, because of the uh, season, because of the summer, right? So um, we want to get, you know, like the, getting the biggest bang for your buck, like, you know, when they talk about coupon and savings and all that, right? We want to get the biggest uh, bang of hasanat, right, for our soul, inshallah. So how is this going to be uh, achieved, inshallah? Well, it uh, comes uh, brings us to the you know topic that before us today, which is how to prepare for Ramadan before, during, and after, which brings us to the crux of our talk. How are we going to prepare for it before? The um, the first most important way to prepare for Ramadan before is just men the mental preparation that is required to get into the month. You mentally have to get into it. You know, if you don't uh, mentally work yourself up, you know, like for example, before there's an event. Uh, now we call something in uh, advertising which is called hype, right? There has to be a, a hype or buzz before the event. Everyone has to kind of be talking about it. Everybody has to be like, you know, uh, posting the flyers and, uh, you know, sending messages on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a big following on these, you know, uh, social uh, media networks, then you know it's going to be a good event, right? But if there's quiet, if there's not much excitement, if there's not, you know, much being posted, you know the event's not going to have a good turnout. It's not going to have, it's, it's not going to be a good event. Same thing um, while preparing for Ramadan. You want to mentally prepare yourselves, your families, uh, you know, and for the greatness of this month. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ uh, used to do. Before the month of Ramadan would come, at the end of Sha'ban, he would address uh, his Sahaba. He would actually talk to them before uh, the coming of the month of Ramadan. He would say, uh, yani He would give glad tidings to his uh, companions. قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ شَحْرُ رَمَضَانِ شَحْرُ مُبَارَكُ إِفْتَرَضَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ صِيَامًا يَفْتَحُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابَ الْجَنَّةِ وَيُغْلِقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابَ الْجَهِيمِ وَتَغُلْ فِيهِ أَشْرَيَاطِينِ فِيهِ لَيْلَ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمَ And this is uh, in the uh, collection of Imam Ahmad رحمه الله تعالى where the Prophet would say before Ramadan that a month is coming to you, a month mubarak, a month that is filled with uh, barakah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made its fasting fault and in it the uh, doors of uh, Jannah are open and it is said to the point that another narration, another hadith mentions that the doors of Jannah are open to the point that no door of it remains closed. Every single door has multiple doors, every single door is open. And the doors of uh, Jahannam are uh, sealed, are locked to the point that none of it, none, none of the doors remain open. Every single door of Jahannam is actually uh, closed. And the, our favorite part is تَغُلُّ uh, الشَّيَاطِينَ right? تَغُلُّ فِيَا الشَّيَاطِينَ which is the shayateen are chained, right? They're all locked up. And, this, and you feel that, subhanAllah. And in this month is a layla, is a, a night which is better than uh, a thousand nights, uh, right? A thousand months. خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ Better than a thousand months. And whoever is deprived of the good of that night, uh, indeed he is deprived. فَقَدْ حَرِمْ يعني there's no mahroom uh, like this person who is deprived of the blessings and the goodness of this night, the worship of which is equivalent to a lifetime of worship, subhanAllah. So, you know, these uh, types of things, in order to take advantage of them, really, one has to be in that, uh, you know, mental state of uh, alertness and even physical uh, preparedness, right? Uh, this is why uh, sometimes it has been recommended to fast, um, you know, in Sha'ban, the first half of Sha'ban, not, not the second half. Uh, you know, for us, it's really difficult to do that. It's like, you know, I don't, I want to keep my same energy for Ramadan and all that, right? Um, but if you look at the um, uh, people who train for the Olympics, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very telling to follow their uh, schedule of uh, physical training. How uh, close up to the actual Olympics do they keep training? So, uh, subhanAllah, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, parallels that can be drawn. Um, okay, now, Another thing about Ramadan is that this is a great time to kind of analyze, you know, I, I always uh, mention this, it's, it's just I can't overemphasize the importance, um, is that you really have to kind of see in Ramadan or right before it, you know, which direction your life is going. You know, is my life uh, really going where I want it to? 
uh, you know, is, is, it, is it just about, uh, you know, uh, biryani and like pots and pans or, or, or is it, am I leaving a legacy behind, you know, am I really, uh, you know, am, is it uh, going to be something that, uh, how am I going to be remembered 10 years after I die? You know, what are, what are people going to say? You know, how is Allah looking down upon me? Am I really happy with what I've accomplished uh, this year? And what am I going to be, where, where do I want to be uh, by next Ramadan? You know, these kinds of things, you know, uh, not, not, I don't want to throw you into a midlife crisis or anything. Um, the Muslim by nature is constantly self-evaluating uh, herself, right? Muraqaba uh, and muhasaba, uh, which was another uh, topic that we covered. Um, and the reason why we mention this is because all of us have things that we have left um, undone, right? There's a saying that, you know, on your deathbed, you, jo you don't just regret the things you've done, but you also regret the things that you've left undone, right? those dreams that you never really, uh, you know, fulfilled. So, um, those, those, those kinds of questions that you don't want to nag at you when, uh, you know, in your older age, when you don't have the energy to pursue them. You know, right now we still have the chance, we still have the energy, we still have, we're still in a position, alhamdulillah, we have not been crippled uh, by old age or by, uh, by disease. And uh, subhanAllah, you know, uh, you, some of you are familiar with the uh, situation that my uh, family is going through. We have an older member in the family that subhanAllah has uh, progressively lost her ability to, uh, you know, engage in any type of, uh, you know, spiritual uh, enhancement. They no longer are able to speak. They're no longer able to, um, you know, do anything that they used to do uh, because of, uh, you know, the disease that they're going through. And so, subhanAllah, when you look at something like that, you know, really life comes to a stop for that person in terms of spiritual progress or being able to even get closer uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if they wanted to, they, they can't. And, um, and even before you can get closer, you have to have that desire. They mentally can't even think about these things anymore. So, subhanAllah, yani, you need, we need to kind of really take advantage this is the, um, what the Prophet Sallallahu said, that there are two uh, blessings about which people are duped about. People are, yani, they take them for granted. And these are al sahha wal faraw right? Which is good health and faraw and time. Good health and time. So, you know, we don't know when either uh, can be taken away from us. So, now in Ramadan, this is a great chance, a great opportunity to um, kind of focus on how we want to use these two uh, blessings of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has blessed us with. And, um, you know, there's always a, there are different ways of doing it. You know, some people do uh, short-term goals, long-term goals, whatever works for you. Um, you know, have some type of plan, have, have some type of goal that you want to achieve, not just for your children, because I know as mothers, all of us have wonderful goals for our children. And that's great. And that's awesome. And we should. But we should also have personal goals. <clears throat> You know, our lives, uh, our, our development shouldn't stop because we're focusing on, you know, the development of our kids. We should be able to, <coughs> inshallah, do both together. Because if we neglect our own um, and development, our own growth, um, our own improvement, then how, what kind of role model are we going to be for the children? What kind of energy are we going to have to help their dreams come true? So this is actually a, a mistake sometimes that, uh, you know, mothers make. Um, so we really need to have to find, a, you know, a way to kind of, inshallah, make sure that we are also uh, spiritually progressing and, and growing, inshallah. Uh, Ramadan, again, I'm going back to intention and mental preparedness. The Prophet also tells us in a hadith which is reported in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, which means it's authentic. Man sama Ramadan imanin wa ihtisaban, ghufiru lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Which means that whoever fasts the month of Ramadan with iman, and ihtisaban, well, I'll explain this in a minute. His uh, previous, all of his sins, uh, his previous sins are going to be forgiven. Everything that he did is going to be forgiven. And there are other narrations that say that he comes or she comes out of Ramadan uh, like the day his mother gave birth to him. And he subhanAllah completely freed from uh, sins. So this is uh, the two requirements of coming out with all our sins forgiven. Because this is what we want, right? We, this is uh, the reason we fast, inshaAllah is to have all our sins forgiven. How do we achieve this? Um, iman and wa ahtisab. When the fast has to be done with iman, of course, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ahtisab, which is you are expecting the reward for the fast. Okay, this is very important. Yani, you're not just doing it in a vacuum. You're not just doing it because everyone is doing it. You're not just doing it because out of a routine. 
the uh, ibadah is the different, uh, the niya, the niya, and having this mental alertness, this mental awareness is the difference between aada and ibadah, right? Aada is a habit, and ibadah is that thing which transforms into worship, right? If someone gets up, for example, a non-Muslim, any in the morning, and they you know wash their face and arms and and feet, is that considered wudu? No, that's just their habit. That's how they uh, you know get ready for work. Let's say. Um, but if you transform that with knowledge and have it have a niya, that becomes something you're rewarded by. To the point that if you do that with this awareness and say the dua after it, subhanAllah, it is said that you can uh, you you get jannah just by this act. So look at the difference between someone who you know just does it out of routine without any knowledge and one who does it with niya. Look at the way that the same act, the same time is transformed. And so subhanAllah, niyyah is that empowering, and we had, uh, like I said, another uh, topic on uh, niyyah, uh, ikhlas, which subhanAllah was a whole hour or so just on this topic. And it, this is the most empowering thing that a Muslim really can take advantage of. You know, with your niyyah, you can, uh, you know, get reward for things that you may physically not be able to do. Like the shay person who dies in their uh, bed gets the reward of a martyr, gets the reward of a shaheed, because they had that sincere intention. They really wanted to, only Allah knows that. No one else uh, knows that, right? Like an example, a shining example of this is Khalid bin Walid, right? Radiallahu anhu. SubhanAllah, there was no uh, part on his body that didn't show the signs of uh, his uh, participation uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet, when, where did he die? He died in bed. So when people would come to uh, see him, uh, they would, uh, he would, he would cry, and he would lift his shirt and say, "Look, there is not a spot on my uh, a body except that it has been uh, injured, it has been wounded for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yet, look at me, how am I dying like a coward? Because he wanted to die in the battle. He had that sincere intention, that sincere niyyah. And then the way they would console him is, look, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told you that you are the Sayfullah, that you are the sword of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that was unsheathed, so it was not befitting." For that sword to be broken on the battlefield. This is the hikmah, this is the wisdom why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not will for you to uh, pass in that way. So this is the hikmah, this is the wisdom. So subhanAllah, you know, if you really, really want it, um, then you, inshaAllah, Allah will bless you with it. What is the power? The power is the niyyah, the power is the intention. Look at the example of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. What was the dua that he used to uh, fervently make? The dua he used to make was that, uh, oh Allah, I, he wanted shahada, right? He wanted martyrdom. But he said, uh, fi madinati rasul, right? In the town, in the city of your rasul. And the people would uh, listen to him. Uh, and any uh, a cursory student of Sira knows that there were no battles in Medina, right? After the, khala, uh, the Prophet ﷺ established the state and the Khulafa uh, came, the battles were fought outside of Medina. Medina is the capital. There's no war within Medina. So how is it that you're asking for shahada? But at the same time, we're going to die in Medina. And subhanAllah, what happened? You know, so we, could, we should never underestimate the power of uh, the, the way that Allah responds to us. The power of dua is amazing. Uh, Umar radiallahu anh was leading the Fajr Salah, right? When Ibn Muljim came through the ranks and stabbed him multiple times, over and over and over, right? He, was, and he stabbed multiple people, uh, you know, in the... Um, and the, in the south, it was dark, so he thought, Umar al thought that it was a dog, a wild dog, that uh, actually was, um, you know, attacking him. And subhanAllah, he fell, he, he fell unconscious, and a few days later he died. Where did he die? In Medina. What did he achieve? Shahada, because of the way that he was killed. So subhanAllah, it's really uh, how badly we want it. You know, how badly do we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How badly do we want to please Him and attain His closeness? It's really that. That's really what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for. Everyone is limited physically by their, uh, you know, in, in terms of their energy and their efforts. But you know, who is it that really wants to and really tries their best? And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be. Everyone is judged differently, right? The way that a stronger person is judged is different from the way a physically weaker person uh, will be judged. Um, now, another amazing thing about uh, Psalm is uh, what makes it unique, what makes it distinct from all the other ibadat, is that this ibadah in and of itself preserves the class. You know that uh, for any ibadah to be accepted, it has to have the quality of ikhlas, right? If ikhlas is missing from an act, 
it is not accepted. It could be the most amazing. It could, you could give a mountain of gold, a gold uh, uh, you know, a mountain's worth of gold in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it is for other than him, if it is tainted with riya, Allah does not accept any of it. It is worthless in his sight, right? But even if you throw you know, a few dates on that uh, mountain of sadaqah, if it's with ikhlas and that's all you had, then that's heavier than that whole mountain, potentially with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really it's the ikhlas. Now, out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows that he will not accept a deed without a complete sincerity of that deed for him alone. How did he design this amazing ibadah of siyam? He designed it in a way that it's not possible to do riya. It's not possible to be insincere while doing it. Because no one knows if you're fasting or not. SubhanAllah. He made it in a way, and this is the deed that he only, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, for everything there is a reward. Every other deed has a 10 times to 710 reward, depending on how uh, your, uh, powerful your intention was, how good your intention was. You get, for every hasana, you get other 10. For example, here I am speaking today, you, to you today, right? Reminding you of the, um, uh, about Ramadan, reminding us all, right? So this one deed can merit 10 hasana, but depending on the intention behind it, or you know, what we want to achieve from it, it can go up to 700 hasana, right? But Psalm is one of those few ibadah that is outside of this realm of calculation. It is outside of this 700 manifold. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As-Sawm li wa ana adzibi. That As-Sawm, as as fasting is for me, and I am going to reward it. Yani it's beyond that uh, calculable uh, figure of 700. And every, because Allah ascribes it to Himself because of the fact that it cannot become tainted uh, with riya. Someone who is fasting and someone who is, uh, is on their monthly uh, course, you cannot tell. Right? It is not possible to tell unless they go and announce it. So, um, Anytime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes anything to himself, it increases the merit and the virtue and the fadl of that deed. For example, when Allah says, uh, bayti, right? That um, purify my house, referring to the Kaaba. What does it do? It magnifies the uh, magnificence of the Kaaba even further because Allah says it's his. Anytime Allah ascribes anything to himself, it magnifies the fadl of that thing, right? Uh, Rasulullah, why is he magnified? He's not any Rasul, right? I can, if I send uh, a child uh, with, a, uh, with a message to someone, she is my Rasul, right? Rasul just means messenger. But when it's Rasulullah, it's the messenger of Allah, then he is only who he is. No one else is that, right? And the same one, this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as bi. That psalm is for me. So there is no, no one else, uh, nothing else, subhanAllah, that can compete with that type of uh, an inscription. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about, so we talked now, all of this is, you know, our talk is about uh, preparing for Ramadan before, during, and after. Now, we talked a little bit about what goes into uh, preparing before Ramadan actually uh, occurs, right? Now, what are we going to do during Ramadan? Now, during Ramadan, which is part two of the talk, um, we're going, to, uh, Ramadan is really the month of the Qur'an. Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. And studying the Qur'an has tangible effects or should have tangible effects on us, right? And there's this spiritual freedom, spiritual freedom that one finds through the study of the Quran. And you, uh, we saw the effects of this study on the Prophet ﷺ himself in the, in the month of Ramadan. Was he studying the Quran in Ramadan? He was always studying the Quran, right? He was always studying the Quran, teaching the Quran. But in Ramadan, he had a special tutor. Right? It was Jibreel, alayhi salam, right? So, uh, not only are you the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who is reciting Quran and teaching Quran, but in Ramadan you get a special teacher, right? The uh, Sayyid al Malaika, right? The in charge of the angels comes to you and teaches or, or you know, discusses and sits with you. And they used to go through the whole Quran, right? Every Ramadan, Jibreel and the Prophet وسلم, used to go through the entire Quran. And in the end, of course, the last year of the Prophet's life, وسلم, they went through the Quran twice. And when Jibreel Islam did that, the Prophet said, I knew this was my last year uh, in the world because they always did it once and that year they did it twice. What would happen to the Prophet وسلم, as a result of this very special tutor? كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَجْوَدُ الْبَشْرُ فَمَا هُوَ أَلَّا أَنْ يَدْخُلْ شَهْرَ رَمَضَانِ فَيُدَارِسُهُ جِبْرِيلِ and this is recorded in the narration of Imam Ahmad. It's a beautiful narration. 
where it is said about the Prophet ﷺ that he used to be the most generous of people. That was just his default uh, nature. Like uh, last night, the Prophet, uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, an incident from his seerah was narrated to us by our wonderful uh, Shaykh uh, Yusuf Aslahi uh, Hafizullah. He was telling us a beautiful story. He said, for those of you that were not there, uh, he said once he found a boy uh, on the streets crying. So he went to the boy and he said, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? That boy answered, my uh, father passed away and my uh, mother remarried. And my stepfather, he actually uh, threw me out of the house. And tomorrow is Eid, so uh, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And it's interesting that he pointed it out because just a, a, a couple of days ago, some of my students were asking me about uh, Um Abdullah. Why is Aisha, radiallahu anha, called Um Abdullah, right? So the Prophet said to him, how would you like it if uh, Rasulullah sallallahu became your father and Aisha became your mother? And he went to Aisha and he said, you know, you were always sad, you know, she didn't have children. You're always sad that you don't have a kunya because a kunya is a title that you get uh, when you have a child, right? Like, I'm Um Zayd. So she said, he said to her, from now on you're Um Abdullah. Right, so subhanAllah, he just, you know, took in that orphan. He just took in that child. You know, that experience of orphanhood, subhanAllah, he really uh, uh, had lived himself. He was able to reciprocate that through the highest levels of generosity. Um, right? So, um, the Prophet by default was just always generous. But what would happen to him in Ramadan is that he, the narration mentions that, you know, he was always the most generous, except that Ramadan would come. And then Jibreel would be teaching him. Yani they would be studying Quran together. And not teaching, but rather Yudari so yani there would be this mutual exchange going on. And he would become more generous than the wind. So subhanAllah, there was you know some amazing spiritual phenomenal impact that the Quran and this teaching and learning of Quran was having that even the generosity of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who is by default the most generous of the Ummah any time, any age would somehow increase you know, when you just thought it couldn't get any more it somehow would this is why Ramadan is the month of the Quran the mix of uh, not eating and drinking the mix of spiritual focus along with uh, you know, accompanying the Quran in the month, in the birth, this is the birth uh, month of the Quran, right? Um, somehow this uh, has an amazing effect on the person. So that, you know, people, you look at them, it's it's them, but they're different, right? You know, it's just such a, a so much more beautiful version of that person comes out. You know, you look at yourself in the mirror and, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, dislike yourself less. Right, no, normally we have uh, right? normally we are constantly blaming ourselves and feeling guilty and uh, feeling that we have uh, you know, not given Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the right that is due. And this is good, but then there's nafs al-mutma'inna, right? And there's a higher goal to be uh, achieved, a higher level that we want to aspire to. And this perhaps we kind of cross paths with this uh, version of ourselves in uh, the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to achieve that. Um, and also, another uh, a very, you know, an interesting gem that I got about uh, uh, Ramadan, I believe uh, Khurra Murad, rahimahullah uh, ta'ala, he mentions, you know, why is it that Ramadan, uh, 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 you know, you have to fast in Ramadan, you know, you, why wasn't fasting in any other month, you know, it's not even a, a from the uh, a sacred months, right, it's not even from the months that are uh, sacred. So why is it that we have to fast in this month? And he said that really in order to uphold the responsibility that the Qur'an makes fard upon all of us, you, you can't fulfill the responsibility that the Qur'an you know, uh, makes us in charge of unless and until you have the type of taqwa that only fasting can produce. This is why you have fasting for the month of Ramadan. Because it's the month of the Qur'an and everything that the Qur'an has made us responsible for is not possible to bear or shoulder without the level of taqwa that only Siyam can produce. So um, this actually, Sheikh Uthman Khan was here last uh, weekend. We had the pleasure of hosting him. He, uh, mashallah, has uh, ijazah in all 10 qara'at and uh, all six books of hadith. And uh, subhanAllah, he's only 27 years old, which is an embarrassment for most of us. Um, so he has an institute, Shaltabi Institute, and he was giving a, a talk last Friday, and this is one of the things he said is that 
Um, the Quran was offered as an amana to the heavens and the earth, right? right? So they uh, refused to uphold it. So, you know, perhaps they had a better understanding. But the insan, the human being, took it up. And what is uh, Allah was giving us reason for that? He is not the walim and oppressor, but extremely oppressive. And he's not just jahid, ignorant, but extremely jahid, extremely ignorant. So, um, Ramadan is a chance to kind of try to decrease the level of uh, walim and uh, jahala that we all have in ourselves uh, as human beings through attaching ourselves uh, to the Quran. Yeah, we are about halfway down. Um, Alhamdulillah, the time is up. So, those are just some of the reflections that I wanted to share. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to become uh, people of action and not people of speech. Uh, people who can walk the walk and not just uh, talk the talk, inshaAllah. Subhanakallahu bihamdika la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.